All right, thank you. All right. Our next topic is tables. And in this class, we've been cultivating good habits. We've been using CSS for the appearance and the layout. But when we talk about tables, I want to take a second to give a bit of a history lesson and, and to go back and talk about how tables were used in the past. All right? First of all, what do I mean by a table? Something with columns and rows. Like a worksheet in Excel. Worksheet, a worksheet in Excel has a set of rows, has a set of columns, and it's like uh, another, another synonymous word would be a grid. All right? So you might have, for example, the distances between two cities. So going down the side, it might be you know, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, Indianapolis and so on and on the top it might be the same cities and then where they intersect it will show you the distance between Cleveland and Indianapolis is however many miles. All right, so that's what I mean by a table. Prior to the widespread support of CSS, a lot of web designers use tables to sort of achieve their layout. All right? And it was an okay thing to do at the time because there was really no other mechanism to do it. All right? In other words, they would make a table, but instead of putting data in it, they'd put HTML stuff in it. So across the top, the first row, there might be a logo and a banner. And in one of the columns, there might be a navigation. And then in one of the columns, there might be the content. And a lot of people learn to do web development this way. So uh, if any of you have, have like done HTML pages like going back years ago, that might have been the way that you learned to do it. And you might still see some examples of that today, but that's becoming far and far less common because it's simply not as flexible as using CSS to style the page. We showed you early in the course CSS Zen Garden where people took an HTML page and displayed it a bunch of different ways based only on changing the CSS. All right. If you use tables for your layout, it sort of locks you into a certain design. And it sort of locks you into a certain grid and a certain structure for the page. And that isn't going to give us the flexibility that we need for different size monitors. And it's not going to give us the flexibility we need for mobile devices and so on. So. If you have learned or if you see examples of people using tables for layout, know that it is not a good strategy and that the, 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 the optimal way to do it is to use CSS. And now again, there's a few browser compatibility issues with CSS, but for the most part, CSS is pretty widely supported. So maybe some of the, the, the brand newest features, there's some issues with browser support, but it's not like the old days where there was, there was widely uh, a big lack of support for CSS. All right, so let's start off and let's create a table. And again, let me show you exactly what I mean by a table. Let's open up Excel. Don't you love this that does so much stuff for you that you have to stare at the screen for 10 seconds to do even the most simplest thing? Let's say we're going to, you know, it's, it's a cold morning. Let's say we're going to, to chart the temperatures in different cities around the world. All right. Let's pick, a, let's pick a few different cities. Let's pick Cleveland. I give up. C L E V. I know how to spell it. I just can't hit the right keys. Cleveland. Uh, let's do uh, 
Rio de Janeiro. They have about the same weather as we do, right? That was a joke. <laughs> uh, let's see. Anchorage. Alaska. Any other choices for cities? San Juan. All right, and let's do January. Let's just do a few months. We'll pick January and July and, oh, and October. Don't ask me why I picked those three months. I just did. All right? So we could fill these in. And this is what I mean by a table. In, 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 in Cleveland, the average temperature in January might be 20 degrees. In July, it might be 83. In October, it might be 58. In Rio, in January, remember, it will be summer there in January. I have a friend that lives in Australia, and it, it's funny to hear them say, you know, oh, spring, you know, spring is here, and all. It's like, what? And it's like, then you realize that it's opposite there. But I don't think it matters much in Rio, so it'll probably be 83 in January, maybe 89, maybe 80. Anchorage probably has better weather than Cleveland, but yeah, <laughs> but we'll we'll go with this. I have no idea how accurate these are. I'm I'm just making them up, so don't. Uh, 100 in July, okay. <laughs> and October. Eighty-five. Okay, so this is a table. Again, there's rows and there's columns. Now notice that each row, for the most part, has the same columns. In this table, each row has the same column, has the same um, number of of uh, columns. All right. Now we know in Excel that we can merge columns together and all that, and you can do that in HTML tables too. All right. But this is our basic start for the table. So let's identify what we have. We have, in fact, I'll do this to make it clear that we have the same number of, same amount of data. All right. What we have, we have our table, that's this. We have rows of the table. And then we have columns. And that's the way that we think of HTML tables. The whole structure is a table. A table consists of a series of rows. Each row contains columns. Now each column can be one of two things. All right, it can be data or it can be a header. In this case, typically, the top line is going to be our header. So I'll make it a different color. And then the rest of the stuff is our data. All right. So we're going to see tags for all of these today. There's really only a handful of tags for tables. We're going to go over the basic ones today. And then probably on Monday, we'll, we'll wrap up tables. Um, but there's corresponding tags for each of these. Now, if we were to simply put this in an HTML document and try to achieve a table by like putting extra spaces between Cleveland and 20, because Cleveland's a shorter word than Rio de Janeiro is, all right, what would happen is because the computer or because the browser ignores white space, it would just scrunch them together anyhow. Likewise, if we put them on each on their own line, again, the browser ignores white space, so it would scrunch them together on the same line. So it would be very hard to format this with the HTML we've learned so far. All right, The best we could probably do is make a series of paragraphs and try to play around with the spacing, but even that is not going to easily work. This is truly a table of data. In other words, if we look at this number, 
We know the value of this number because we can go up to see the header and we can go across and say that this is Anchorage for October. All right, so let's go and let's build uh, a, an HTML document that contains this table. I'll go in here and I'll create my HTML, or I'm sorry, my doc type first. I don't know if I, if we discuss this in class, but it's worth discussing now. What happens if you omit the doc type? What happens if you omit the doc type? Pardon me? I'm sorry, I still can't hear. Crap it's a crapshoot. Okay, um, that's a good, uh, th that's a pretty good way to put it. All right, because if you violate any of the rules of HTML, um, you're really at the mercy of the browser and how the browser chooses to implement the incorrect HTML. But the doc type is a little bit different. If you omit the doc type. The browser thinks it's a very old HTML page prior to the use of doc types. And the significance of that is back in the old days, browsers got a lot of things wrong, especially concerning CSS and width and, and stuff like that. So without the doc type, the browser assumes it is a very old web page and it, it goes into what is called quirks mode. Uh, and quirks mode is sort of a based on the buggy implementation of CSS and your CSS is likely not to work very well. All right. So the bottom line is always put your doc type in there. All right. The doc type tells the browser, hey, this is an HTML document. I can play by these rules instead of by these sort of, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, convoluted um, quirky old-fashioned rules that the browser went under. All right. So, what do you suppose the tag for a table is? The table tag, all right. So we have a start and an end around the whole table. A table in HTML is a collection of rows. So included in the table tag is going to be a bunch of TRs. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five TRs. So we'll have five TRs that are included in the table. Each TR is comprised of a table column. And just as we represented here, there's two kinds of table columns that you can have. You can have a header or you can have data. And the header are represented in TH tags. The data are represented in TD tags. So typically, oftentimes, the top row of a table will consist of TH tags because that's headers. It's not actual data. In other words, the word January is not a temperature. It's a, a, a label for that column. It's a header for that column. So there'll be four THs in the first row. Each subsequent row, there'll be four TDs. All right. Typically, you're going to have the same number of columns in each row. There are exceptions, you know, it's, it's hard to say always, all right, because, you know, as soon as you say always, you can think up of an exception to it, but typically there will be the same number of columns in each row. So, I'll put the first one in, T1, 
T-H. And that is the word city. M-T-H. And T-H. January. What do you mean follow each other? Oh, yeah. They could be. They could be on one line like this, all right? Again, I, I don't have a strong preference on how you do it. When you do it, you should do it with readability in mind. And if you feel for you that that's more readable, then, then fine, by all means do it that way. This for me seems to be a more readable way because I can see lined up all the different columns in this table. All right. The data cells then, so from the second row on, it's going to be TD cells. And 208358. I guess one of the reasons I would do it like this is it's easy for me to tell at a glance as I'm maintaining the table that this belongs to that. If it was spread out horizontally, I could still do it, but I'd have to spend, you know, looking and counting and all that. That makes it a little more obvious. Let me do the other rows. Should be eighty nine, eighty three, because right, that's summer in January. Fourteen sixty five, thirty two, and then finally. All right, let's go and save this and view it in the browser. All right, there we go. We can get rid of this now. Open up in our browser and you'll see we have the table. And notice how things line up in deep columns. So we didn't have to like figure out how to pad it out with spaces. By virtue of the fact that we put it in, in rows and columns, it lined things up. A couple of observations about this. How big is this table? Pardon me? Well, it's very small. But how big is e how big is how big is each column? Let's let's do it that way. How wide is each column? 
Are they the same width? No. How wide are they? Well, based on the heading, based on the widest thing. Now, in most of these, you're right, it's the heading. But in the case of Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro is wider than city. All right? So, the answer to how big uh, this table is, is it's as big as the content that fills the table rows and table cells. So each column is as wide as it needs to be. How wide does it need to be? It needs to be wide enough to accommodate the widest thing in the column. And the total width of the table is simply the sum of the widths of the individual column plus a little bit of, of padding between them or, or margin between them. All right? Because we wouldn't want Rio de Janeiro to run into 89. All right? So there's a little bit of margin there. Notice a couple other things. The headers are bold. The THs are bold. And what might not be obvious here is that the THs are centered over the content, whereas the TDs are left aligned. Now, it's most obvious to see that in the case of the city column. All right? Because with the city column, you can see the word city is centered and the, diff the individual cities are right aligned, I'm sorry, left aligned. The temperature columns don't look like they're centered, but they are. They're centered within a width that matches their size exactly. In other words, the, the column for January is this wide. And the word January is centered within that space. All right? July is centered within this space. October is centered within this space. City is centered within the space of the whole column. All right? So they're all centered even though they don't look it necessarily. You have to think about it, but, but they are in fact centered. Now, this again gets to sort of the, the statements I've been making periodically about how your page looks. All right? I've always said, remember, how your page looks is based on a combination of your CSS code and the browser defaults. All right? In this case, I have no CSS code, so this is the plain, flat-out browser defaults. All right? Now, we can certainly go in and change any of this via CSS to make it different. So by default, it makes TDs not bold and left aligned, and it makes THs centered and bold. If we don't like that, maybe we wanted, for example, maybe we want the city, maybe we want the headers to be left aligned. Does that mean we put those in TD tags? No. All right, you don't lie to your browser to get it to look a certain way. That's a table heading. That's a TH, all right? Therefore, it should be a TH. But if I want the TH to look differently, I do it via the style rule, all right? So that's a very important concept. The HTML should describe what each piece of content is. The CSS allows us to make that content look any way we want to. So if we want those THs to look like TDs, we don't change them into TDs. They're till, still THs, we just style them differently. So how could we style THs to look like TDs? Well, <clears throat> in our head section, we can put a style tag, and again, or, uh, a style tag. and again, I'm only doing this so it's easy to see in one file. Typically, you should be using external style sheets. But if I go in and say THs, Font weight normal. Text align left. That makes those THs look like TDs. So we can get. 
Well, what would happen if I didn't specify the font weight? What's it going to use? It's going to use, again, the browser default. So again, it's a combination of what we say plus the default for the browser. So if I simply said text align left and, and omitted the font weight, then the browser's default font weight for THs would apply, and which is normally for THs, they're bolded. Okay. Now, we can represent THs a bunch of different ways, right? We don't have to just keep the default or center or bold or whatever. We could make these any number of different ways. We could, for example, make the TH have a font size 1.2 M and make the color blue. Then the table looks like that. All right. Let's play around with styling this even more. All right, we'll spend uh, a bit of time styling this to get it the way we look like. Because we've already seen what the default behavior is. And if we don't specify something, we're going to get the default behavior. Behavior, But if we do specify something, that'll take precedence over the browser's default. What do you mean put it in a grid? Oh, yeah. Put, put put the actual lines there. Sure. In fact, let's do that. We'll do that eventually. We might not do that right off, but we'll do that at some point. All right. Right off the bat, I'm going to start. I'm going to make the table bigger. Table width, 50%. Min width. 300 pixels. I like the min, the mid, min width attribute because what tends to be the problem with like a lot of liquid layouts is when they get so small, stuff starts to overlap each other. Well, if you put the minimum width, you can control it to make sure it doesn't get smaller in a certain amount and then you won't run into that problem. No. What this is saying is the width, I'm going to set it to 50% of the available space. What's the available space? The available space of the whole window, the whole browser window. But I'm not going to take it lower than 300 pixels. So for example, if the window was 1,000 pixels wide, this would have a width of 500 pixels. If the window was 800 pixels wide, this would have a way, uh, width of 400 pixels. If the width of the window was 500 pixels, though, 50% of that is 250 pixels, but we specified that we don't want it smaller than 300, so it would get the width of 300. And we can, we can kind of see that. I'll do a save here and refresh. There it's taking up half the screen. As I make it smaller or bigger, smaller, 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 it'll get to a certain point. This must be like 600 pixels right here. Because at a certain point, then it doesn't get any smaller. Because it's, so it's not going less than the minimum. Now, notice this, too. All right. Notice that, how big did it make the columns? Previously, it made, when we didn't define any width for the table, it made the columns as wide as they needed to be. All right? Now, obviously, we made the table bigger than it needs to be. So how wide is it making the columns? No, because if you look, 
city takes up more space in July. City column takes up more space in July. Well, no, because if it was that, then all of them would be the same width, where all these columns are not the same width, right? July is not as wide as the city column. City column is much wider than July. In essence, it makes it proportional to the size of their content. In other words, city is always going to be the biggest column because city has the most content in it. So if I make it small and it's 300, city gets a bigger share of those 300 pixels. If I make it wider and it's 1,000 pixels wide and the whole table is 500, city still gets the biggest share of those 500 pixels. So our observations, if we don't specify a width, it will make the width as big as it needs to be for each column. Observation one. Observation two. If we do set the width of the whole table, all right, but not the width of the individual columns, then it will make the size of the individual columns proportional to their content. Now, I could put a size on the column. I could say I want each TH to be have a width of 25%. That would be 25% of the available space or 25% of the whole table. So, now each one of these columns is even. Each one of these is 25%. And if it's bigger or if it's smaller, notice what it even did. To keep things fair, it dropped the word Gennaro down to the next line. Now, a couple things. A table isn't going to cut off content. That's one consideration. In other words, what is the longest city name in the world? I have no idea. I'm going to make so I'm going to make one up. One of those, I don't know, Scandinavian cities or something. Or or from where my ancestors come from in Poland where the Names are gigantically long. Okay, so there's the longest city in the world. Notice what it did. It sort of broke it. It sort of broke my rule. All right. In other words, I specified that each column should be 25% wide, but then I gave a humongous chunk of data in one of the columns. And there's no spaces in it either for it to break it like it did with Rio de Janeiro and put it on its own line. So what's it going to do? Well, it's possible to give, through your styling rules, how do I want to put this? Impossible things for the browser to do. I can't give each one of these 25% of the table if that city is so gigantic. All right? It just can't allocate the space, especially when we get to smaller si when we get to smaller sizes. So what does it do? Well, it has to resolve it one way or another. So at that point the browser decides how to how to how to size it. And it's going to size it in a way not to cut off any data. Let me show you another example. Let me delete this. What if I set a width of these to, of each of the columns to 35%? 
Obviously, it can't give four columns each 35%, right? That would be a total of 120%? No, 140%. So what does it do? Well, it kind of gets the idea that we want to make them equal, so it doesn't give them all 35%, but it does make them all equal. I guess my point is, is that you can give conflicting instructions in your CSS, and the browser will sort of figure it out and display it the way that it's best. Browsers are actually wonderful things in that regard. Browsers are very flexible, and if you give them things that are impossible, it won't blow up. It'll just, it might ignore some of your instructions, like in that case, it didn't make each one of them 35%, because it couldn't, but it did make them all even, all right? And it's possible that a different browser might implement that slightly differently. I will, I will, how do I want to say this? I will encourage you not to micromanage things. The browsers are very smart, so let the browsers do their job, all right? And you don't need to control every single pixel via your CSS. You can let the browsers do their default behavior, and a lot of times that's good enough, and that will get the job done. All right, we mentioned borders. We could pretty up this table a little bit by putting in a border. So I can say border two pixels solid black. And that'll put a border around the whole table. All right? Not the grid lines that you talked about, but around the table. Now, we could do this. I could say TR I have one, pic one pixel red solid. I'm thinking it would be solid, but I guess I don't know that. The fall is invisible. <laughs> First I put TR, I tried to put it on the row. I did TD instead, which is table data. Now I could do this and say one pixel red solid. Let's make it bigger. Let's make it three pixels so it's a little more obvious. And there we kind of have the grid. I could do this. I could put around the TDs and the THs. All right. Now you look at that, you might like that, or you might not like that. All right. I kind of don't like the fact that there's a little bitty gap between those things. I'd rather have them be nice grid lines as opposed to little boxes around those. That actually is an attribute on the table tag where we can say border collapse, collapse. This is similar to margin collapse. Remember way back we talked about margin collapse, how if there was uh, two margins, all right, it wouldn't necessarily add them together. If there, one had a margin of 10 pixels on the bottom and the other had a margin of 10 pixels on the top, it wouldn't give you a total margin of 20 pixels. 
it would give you a margin of 10 pixels because that satisfies both conditions. Well, borders work the similar way, and, but not by default. We have to specify that we want the border collapse to collapse for this guy. And then we have that. Sure. Okay. Okay. Excellent question. What if we wanted, let's say for example, we wanted to highlight San Juan, all right, because that's the hottest July temperature, all right. Give it an ID tag, all right. So what I could do is I could do this. You could do this a couple different ways. This is the probably the, 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 the most efficient way to do it, but you could, you could do it very similar to this. I could say ID equals hottest. All right. Then I could go in my style rule and say within the ID equals hottest, all TDs, should have a border that is purple. Three pixel solid. And then those get the border that would be purple. Yeah, sure, sure. One thing at a time. Um, <laughs> color purple. It's a little hard to see that. Um, let's make the color red. Make it more obvious. It was purple, but it's kind of hard to distinguish between the two. All right, there we go. And your question of shading? You mean like the background of the cell? Yeah, we could we could say background. Um, Let's make the background red and the color black. Make the color white. It might be re more readable. And we can make the font size maybe a little bigger. So remember, you know, this is kind of what I said when we were talking about forms. Everything that we've done with style for anything else, for the most part, we can do with form elements. We can do it with table elements. So we were able to change the background color of a, a, a section of the page, for example. Well, we can change the background color of a row or of a cell or anything along those lines. It's just a matter of getting the selectors right. All right? Getting the selectors right to select the, the specific things that we want to do. Again, using our three main tools and using them in combination, our three main tools are the HTML tag, if we want all of them to look a certain way, a class, if we want certain members that are grouped together to look a certain way, or an ID, if there's one thing that we want to treat differently. So if I wanted to, for example, treat, you know, the warm weather cities differently than the cold weather cities, I could define a class for warm, all right, and I could put it on Rio and San Juan. And then instead of an ID which specifically pointed to San Juan, I could create a class for warm cities and you uh, and assign that class to both San Juan and Rio. And then I could treat the warm cities differently than the cold cities. Uh, 
you can use pretty much what uh, any names you want. Don't put don't try to put spaces in the names so. though. Both for classes and IDs. Don't don't put spaces. So if I did warm cities, for example, just to kind No. Class is a class. DIV is a div tag. Can assign a class to any HTML tag. A div is a specific division of your page. Specific section of your page. So I could put in warm city. I could define Rio and San Juan as a class of warm city. And then I could define a style for any TD within the class of warm city. And then both Rio and San Juan get treated that way. So again, that's your hooks to your HTML that you can assign styles to. Your HTML tags, the IDs, and the classes. All right. Beyond that, for the most part, anything that you can do via CSS on one sort of thing, you can do on another. All right. OK. Yeah, I, I mentioned that at the beginning of this example. I did it just so that we could see both of them at the same time. Normally, the preferred way would be to make an external file. But yeah, just so I don't have to switch back and forth between screens uh, for, you know, for ease in the lecture, I, I put them both in the same file. All right, we'll, we'll see you in lab.